You're listening to the Archaeology Podcast Network. Hi, hello and welcome to Digging Up Ancient Aliens. This is the podcast where we examine strange claims about alternative history, pseudoscience and ancient aliens in popular media. Do the claims hold water to an archaeologist or are there better explanations out there? We are now on episode 51. I am Frederick, your guide into the world of pseudo archaeology. This time we have a guest with us, a historian, in fact, who will discuss a few clips about uh, classical Greece and Rome with us. We will learn that we can all be fooled when there are, well, several emperors with the same name and you don't really specify which one you're talking about. And the ancient alien proponents will definitely use this to their advantage. We will also discuss source criticism, how historians approach a subject, and of course, Alexander the Great's battle with a UFO. So stay tuned for an interesting conversation. Remember that you find sources, resources, and reading suggestions on our website, diggingupancientaliens.com. There you can also find contact info if you notice any mistakes or have any suggestions. And again, a huge thank you to all patrons and ArchPod um, subscription members out there. And if you can't afford to support the show with money, well, then you can leave a fancy five-star review instead. That costs you nothing except uh, two, three seconds of your time. And when we're finished with all these preparation. Well, let's dig into the episode. So, I want to welcome for the first time a historian to the show on the Archaeological Podcast Network. Hello, Angela. Hello, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Good. So you have a TikTok channel called History with Angela. Yes. And History with Angela. There you present uh, different topics from history to the wider public. I think it's in English. <laughs> yes. <laughs> But could you maybe tell a little bit uh, about yourself, a little bit about your background within history? Just so everybody gets a little picture on who you are. Yep. So um, basically, I was I'm studying classics and ancient history. Hopefully, fingers crossed, I've just done my final exam. So as of December, I should be graduated <laughs> with my degree, um, bachelor's there. I don't know. I might do honours. I might not. We'll see how it goes. Life's a bit tricky, but that side of things. Um, then, like you said, I've got a TikTok channel. And the main thing with that was to connect with people about something that's I find is enjoyable to mm. talk about and that not always everybody in your immediate circle might be interested in learning about mythology and all that. And I also like <laughs> just just simplifying it because I think there's this misconception that especially with ancient history, it's all just dates and wars and all the boring stuff. But I'm just trying to show you that actually maybe it, it can be simplified and it can be a little bit more interesting than just remembering 500 different dates and emperors. So that's the gist of it. So you would, would it be fair to say that you're trying to show the other side of history? Yes. Yeah, I think so. Because I've been looking at it's more focusing about the women in ancient uh, Rome and Greek that maybe isn't as uh, commonly discussed in the public forums as maybe the Roman generals and uh, the vastness of Roman Empire. Yeah, definitely. And to be honest, I kind of stumbled on that whole genre almost by accident because I just took it for granted that people were <laughs> more aware of these types of things and then when I started posting about it like obviously a lot of people are interested in it but then I was also maybe not shocked but more like some of the backlash that you get the second that you start discussing something that's not so common everybody's very quick to point out oh like this isn't 100% accurate or this can't be 100% proven Whereas when you go to something that's maybe a bit more widely accepted, um, that back, backlash, again, I don't know if that's the right word, but it isn't so common. So that's when I started. Well, actually, maybe if I start posting, 
and always try and at least have a couple of sources and stuff in the captions just to try and say that, hey, just because you might not have heard about this, it doesn't mean that these things don't exist. What was the thing that you discovered recently that surprised you the most in this um, type of research? Um, I think it's how quick people are to discredit like uh, sometimes I feel like Plutarch is an excellent example everybody loves to hate Plutarch so the second you mention Herodotus who's my favorite the second you mention Plutarch or Herodotus everybody is very quick to say it's Plutarch it's rubbish it's rubbish it's Herodotus it's rubbish and I think it's for me it's that narrow viewpoint of just discarding it whereas I look at it more as it might not be a hundred percent true but it existed. So somebody all those centuries or thousands of years ago was talking about it. So then why is it suddenly wrong that we are also talking about it now? So the fact that it existed shows that it was kind of in that realm of possibility. So even the one where the women, where Sulla's army was marching in and then the women were lining the rooftops and they're throwing all the bricks down and One, people are telling me I've got the wrong emperor. I'm actually talking about like this Greek story. Other people are, of course, saying it's nonsense and all these things when actually, no, it was quite common that that's something that the women would do. They would take the roof tiles and they would throw them down. It wasn't like this one story and it never happened again. It's just not a tactic. Well, actually, maybe not a tactic that's as well known, not one that is as yes, well spoken about as the men going off and marching into battles. Um, there's a guy I found, he's got this very interesting um, research paper that he did where he even calculated the velocity of like the how much these roof tiles would have weighed, how much it cost per roof tile. So like what they were actually throwing onto the army in a monetary value and in a physical value. <laughs> yeah, that was quite good. <laughs> so uh, yeah, roof tiles can be a weapon. Yes. Is what we learned much. here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Three kilos of brick falling on your head probably is going to hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so are you familiar with ancient aliens before I had you watch <laughs> some <laughs> selected clips from? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm trying to tell you, it's, I, I, I'm familiar with it, but I struggle to get through <laughs> an episode because it, it, it's annoying and <laughs> that's I don't mean to sound mean. Um, it's more like it's frustrating because you want to be like, like yell at, not yell at them, talk to them and be like, hey, I don't know where, what you're talking about. Can you clarify? And it just gets to, I'm like, never mind. I'll just, I'll watch something that I know. I'll, Game of Thrones, at least, you know, they've made that up and they're clear about it. So yeah, probably haven't watched it to the extent you have. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the beginning, it's quite easy to just stand and yell at the television, <laughs> trying to have a dialogue, but uh, it's not the medium that really <laughs> gives in. <Works>. But <laughs> no. <laughs> no, the cat's not going to listen. But you were never into this ancient alien stuff or had people want to talk about the uh, ancient alien uh, things with you when you say, oh, I'm a historian or come on onto your TikTok feeds asking que- these type of questions. No, surprisingly enough, my, like I said, my biggest conspiracy is that Plutarch existed. So <laughs> in, that, um, in that sense, oh, actually, well, maybe not so much Atlantis. I remember, um, and again, not so much on TikTok. It was more when I tried to do YouTube and failed there, but uh, that side of things. Uh, so something like Atlantis, and I feel maybe because that's a bit more well known. Mm. Um, there, I had some of the conspiracy theories about I don't even remember now Athens and aliens and whoever, whatever else happened there. So yeah, but that's about the extent. Also, I try not to be controversial, so <laughs> maybe I just avoid the <laughs> alien subjects. <laughs> but now you're forced, and should we maybe? Start so we got a selection of uh, mm-hmm. clips. Yep. Because as we all know, ancient aliens have issues trying to stick to one subject and more shotgun it and just go all over the place. Uh, but uh, should we start with Pandora and Pandora's jar? How do you feel as an historian? How did you feel about that section? I felt like they were cherry picking almost the bits and pieces that worked with whatever message they were trying to put across. So like, for example, the the whole muses thing, 
um, like they're like Hesiod said that he spoke to the muses and completely ignoring the fact that, I mean, Homer did the same thing. So were you claiming that Homer has also spoken to these aliens and therefore Zeus and everybody else is real? And again, with the muses, particularly with because they've really focused on, you know, these muses are these creatures that were brought down to earth. I mean, yes, okay, you could consider that. But I think when you actually study it, the way that the muses were used, particularly when you think that Hesiod was an oral poet, for example, so mm. like they were devices within the text. Um, so yes, it lent authority to what they were saying, but it also it, it was a plot device in some instances. Like if they really wanted you to pay attention to something, or if there was something that they wanted to remember, then they evoke the muses. So I feel like they just completely ignore every other possibility and they're just like, no, definitely it was these creatures and Hesiod said that he spoke to them so he, that he meant that literally. He definitely spoke to them. He wasn't just being like, I need some credibility so I'll say I spoke to some muses. Um, that, that was my first reaction. <laughs> How would you as a historian use, for example, Hesiod in your research or would Hesiod be um, a source that you would utilize in your historic research or if it's, is it more trying to describe the society he lived in? Uh, because Hesiod comes in two phases, right? So he's got his theogony, which is like the mythology side. And mm. I think from that, it is very, it is important. And I think it runs parallel to Homer because it's like understanding where the Greek mythology side came from and it had this huge impact on their lives. So it's good to see the roots there. And then the other one, the works and days, which he did, that is more like about the day-to-day -day lives and the farming and all those types of things. So I think in my opinion, he's a pretty good primary source in that sense. <laughs> I mean, he's telling us from his perspective how people lived and it's a good contrast I feel with his two works because it's the the beliefs and mm. then it's the day-to-day -day. so that's I mean whenever I look at a myth how, how do I put it clearly <laughs> um, when when I'm looking at mythology and how it's worked I always like to go back to the original source to see how it's evolved so for me somebody like Hesiod and Homer I always try to go back to them and see where did it start from and then where like when Greek tragedy and all that starts to kick into place how were these myths then adapted to suit the society at the time because obviously they were using them for a bit of a different purpose there they were trying to make them political make them get a response out of people so I feel in that sense that would be how Hesiod would work for me if I was yeah that makes sense I think it makes sense to use it in that way but if we so they are a product of their time yes the muses they are used from by hesio they are used by even philosophers when they trying to tell their philosophy for example uh, socrates uh, were imbuing them muses when he told his atlantis story something we have dealt mm -hmm. with on this show in the past um, yep. could we see them as a way of saying this is true or would it be more of, I'm making this up, but I want you to think it's true? I think it's a mixture. So from the way that I understand them is they were using them to boost the authority of the person who was speaking. So be it Socrates, be it Hesiod, they were using it to say, um, I've got a special relationship with these divine agents. So therefore what I'm saying is true. And there's this whole interesting study as well around because in Hesiod particularly, the muses actually say that they don't always tell the truth. So <laughs> it's like, is <laughs> Hesiod including that point to kind of be like, if I'm wrong about something, it's not because I'm wrong, but it's because I was lied to. And But I think because there was also cults and things surrounding the muses as well. So not only, like it might be unfair to say from our perspective that they were only using it to kind of lend authority to what they were saying and trying to make themselves look better. I think that there is that potential there that it, it was a religious belief and that, you know, maybe they did feel like they had spoken to the muses or that the muses had spoken through them and that they were kind of passing that on. I think a good comparison is maybe though, if you look, I just revert back to Homer because he's a bit more easy, <laughs> but um, <laughs> in Homer, because he refers to the muses as well, but he does it with both the muses where he says, you know, the muses tell me this, but then he also uses Odysseus. 
So it's never Homer telling you anything. He's always like either the muses said this or Odysseus is the one who is telling this story. So I'm not lying about this magical island with like a sorceress. Um, This is just what Odysseus claims to have happened. So maybe when we start looking at things like that, it is like you say, they're just trying to lend authority to their story and trying to make it like I should be listened to because obviously divine inspiration or, you know, the muses have given the poet this divine symbol of power and authority, which they're then able to pass on to the common folk. Yeah, now my main strength isn't um, ancient Greek uh, literature and things like that. But as far as I understand it, for a very long time, it was an oral tradition. You weren't really meant to write it down and read it. So would the muses be to give the poet room to change the story as the audience needs for that particular storytelling session? Or would that be a fair assumption? Or is it more... Uh, extension of the religious idea of the time, maybe? I, to be honest, from the way that, like, it seems almost impossible to believe, but from what I understand, they were very good at remembering these ridiculously long, <laughs> like, poetry. So, yes, of course, it might have changed. And it, like you say, it's a good get out of jail free card because, oh, well, you know, the muses said it. But I think in that instance more, when you look at certain things, and I think it, I, I don't speak ancient Greek or read ancient Greek or anything like that, but I think when you look at the way that it's written in some of the key points, when they'll suddenly invoke the muses again, it's almost like a memory device as well. Hmm. So they know when you get up to this point, then you, rem- you remember, oh, okay, the muses said this, and then you can kind of stall for time almost, I think. That's one of the things that we learned about when it was in regards to the oral tradition, that some of it was as simple as stalling for time so that the poet could remember where they were up to and then just keep going. Yeah. So as a historian, when we want to look at historical sources, what are the challenges when you're going back to the classic sources? Authenticity. Uh, obviously, we, d- we don't have a lot of of original originals, even the works of Homer, Hesiod and all that, like they were written down much later, as you point out, like they were oral traditions. So what we have, it might not even necessarily be the original. And I think a very good example of that is the Pandora myth, which is what they're gibbering on about because there's this whole thing around the fact that hope was left in the jar and everybody's like, oh, yeah, that's a very good, clear, defined symbol. But actually... It's more that the way they uh, or the way that it's been looked at is that we don't actually have the full myth anymore. Hmm. So they're not actually sure was hope even supposed to be left in the jar? Is there like a huge chunk of the story that's missing? Like we don't quite understand because it doesn't really make sense, does it? Like why is hope in the jar? Why didn't hope escape with everything else to go and protect the world? So like it's trying to interpret, you're trying to interpret these things which we don't have the full picture for. Yeah. And and also going back to the muses as well, it's trying to look at it not from our perspective but from the perspective of somebody who was living in that time. So we can look at it and say, oh, they were using the muses in this way, but for all we know, that's not what they were thinking at all. So those are, yeah, the challenges. And when you want to uh, determine the usefulness of an account... How would you approach that as a historian? Finding multiple accounts is always a good one. So when you have more than one source telling you something, then at least you can kind of say, okay, well, it most likely did at least happen. Um, And then you can start to look at other perspectives, see where they match, um, see where they differ. And then also try and find reasons why they would differ, like who, when was this person writing? And we see that a lot in you know, the later Roman Empire when you start looking at all those Roman historians, like what was their own personal bias? How close were they to the original sources? Um, and Because another thing, when you look at Plutarch, all these guys, <laughs> like we take for granted, if we want to look at something, we just quickly go to Google or, you know, we can – pretty much have that information at our fingertips. But somebody like Plutarch, he would have travelled and he would have gone to libraries, he would have read all these sources, but he wouldn't necessarily have been able to write absolutely everything down. So when he was writing his accounts um, and he's saying, you know, I read that blah, blah, blah said this, it's not that he's necessarily intentionally 
putting forth the wrong information, but he might unintentionally be misremembering something which he did actually cite the primary source for. So that's why it's a good idea. If you can have lots of different sources, you can start to see what are the similarities, what are the differences and where might they have gone completely wrong. And then later you can also look at that with like archaeological evidence and see, you know, was that city really there? Could we see any other signs Mm. and things like that, of course. What's your biggest challenge as a historian? (laughs) Cross-referencing. I think is the <laughs> biggest one for me um, because it's there's this uh, almost paranoia that like you find one thing that looks really interesting and then either it's been misrepresented or there's just nothing else to back it up. So you get very excited. You're like, oh, this sounds like a great little gem of information that I've found, but <laughs> really there's nothing else. And I think what annoys me, I wish I'd had the time to be able to like learn ancient Greek or at least Latin or something like that, Mm. because I feel when you can actually read the original text, you're able to get a much clearer, well, not clearer, but you could be more confident that the understanding that you're getting from it is actually closer to what you wanted. So I feel also a good thing to do is also look at different translations That's one thing that I always do. So if I'm looking at a source that's been translated, look at different translations and then try and work out are people interpreting this work differently? Mm. Like, yeah. There's a lot of people out there in the audience who uh, is looking into source criticism and all of that. How do you approach source criticism from a historian perspective? Obviously finding other other points of view or what other people have written on it. So like if you're um, writing about a topic, it's all well and good to say that's your understanding, but it's making sure that you're getting a broader picture of the, like the academia that's been written or published or produced on what you're trying to understand. So it's not just saying, oh, I'm looking at this um, coin and in my opinion this coin is representative of x y and z but it's making sure that what are other people saying on the topic so that it's not i don't i don't think it's supposed to be an isolated ad- adventure like you're supposed to be able to do it with your peers right you, you need to see what other people have thought on it if they've found out things that you don't necessarily know or views that you haven't considered and that you're not just making things up and saying well this is the story that i see and we'll just roll with that but Angela, did you know that that uh, Alexander the Great encountered UFOs? Yes, definitely he did. <laughs> and they scared all his elephants. <laughs> Is that a story that you have heard before? <laughs> no. <laughs> because then I was looking in that one scene where they've got the coin and they zoom in on that one particular part of the coin and they're like this, like they don't say it, but they're implying that this coin is showing the aliens that scared off the elephants and that's why Alexander <laughs> lost the battle. <laughs> but then the stupid thing is that coin is actually commemorating a battle that he won in <laughs> India. So they've just like taken a victory <laughs> and decided that it's a defeat by aliens and there we go. That's the new narrative. And even if you looked at it, so even if you said, okay, I believe you, aliens exist, but why would, why would you put a a loss, like a defeat on a coin? It doesn't make sense. Like he was, Alexander was making these coins as propaganda essentially. And on the other side of the coin, like you have Nike crowning Alexander. So why would he be going, oh, here guys, this is the story of the time I lost to aliens. It just doesn't make sense, does it? Because they were the alien overlord. I don't really understand what they <laughs> what they often intend to represent with these narratives. But I think that's part of the issue or lore maybe with ancient aliens that they put out a lot of this information that you don't really have access to as a normal person. Because everything they say sounds quite credible if you just look at it without any deeper insight to it. I'm just going to pause the episode here and thank you, my dear listener, for tuning in. 
It's great having you here exploring the world of pseudoscience with me. If you want to support the cause of educating people and combating pseudoscience, I'd like if you become a Patreon or a paid subscriber of the show for as little as 250 per episode, which is less than what the Loch Ness Monster asked for. You will help me continue producing high quality content and gain access to a treasure trove of exclusive bonus material. Imagine the benefits of becoming a paid subscriber where you gain VIP access to our exclusive pseudoscientific book club. You will have the opportunity to hear me read and discuss the works of our favorite on-screen experts for you. To sign up and become a paid subscriber, simply head over to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. You will find all the information you need to join our community there. Your backing of the program would empower me to create more content that assists people while keeping the show as accessible as possible. So let's combat misinformation and pseudoscience together. Just head over to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support to sign up. Together we will uncover the truth one episode at a time. Have you dealt a lot with Alexander the Great or is that not really something you bring up in your during your studies at least? No, so a lot of my and again mostly personal interest was it's more the mythology side of things mm. and a little bit pre Alexander the Great. So but I mean so even from what you were saying so like I'm not 100% familiar with it but my first instinct is always well hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> Let let me first find out what battle you're talking about because they're not even very clear what battle they're talking about. And then as soon as I saw that coin, I'm like, that makes zero sense. Like, why is there a coin that shows his defeat? Even <laughs> even if it's not an alien, there would never be a coin showing a defeat. Like, that's just a waste of resources. Um, so, and I think that's a very good <laughs> approach in general <laughs> to. <laughs> to take when you're looking at something and even if I'm reading something I'll always be like hang on I'm, I'm not familiar with that I would never say it's wrong I would say I'm not familiar with that <laughs> let me make a note <laughs> and see if I can find some other information to back that up yeah that's the part or a key point of ancient aliens or alternative historians in general they don't want to be specific because they've learned since the invention of internet it's a lot easier to you know go and look stuff up that's why they usually just grab certain keywords put it together because if you search that sentence you will get it to the ancient alien narrative because you won't be able to find the original source that way which of course is you know they don't want you to really learn more. They want to sell you the product of ancient aliens. Um, but historians, history is usually depicted as a very lonesome thing to do, that you're by yourself, researching by yourself, and uh, put out publications by yourself. Is that the current state of history research, or is is it starting to change a little bit? Yes and no. I feel like for the more, not advanced is the wrong word, but the more in-depth stuff, I feel like it's still a lot more isolated because just even accessing the information to be able to educate yourself about the more complex issues, it's incredibly hard. Like, um, I'm like, how do you access journal articles if you're not subscribed, if you're not at a university? Mm. How do you cross-reference the sources? Um I mean, a favorite thing people like to say is, oh, just go on Wikipedia. Wikipedia is um, great because they've got sources on it. But then realistically, how would you how would you check some of those sources if you have no access to them? Those sources could be anything, and half the time they are. Um, but so in that sense, I do feel like it's isolated. But at the same time, I think, and a lot of that is to do with social media and that being able to gain some more interest, it's, it's almost forcing it to become a bit more open because – People are getting interested, people are engaging and people are realizing, hang on, if I'm able to um, share my research and you just look at TikTok, like there's so many um, like amazingly educated people doing their PhDs, all these things, sharing the information that they're learning and the engagement that they're getting is humongous. And I feel like that is actually going to start pushing the whole thing into more of a less isolated field 
when they realise that um, actually it, it doesn't have to be on its own. You don't just have to be your his, like a historian locked up in your study with your quill and ink and writing your own notes. You, you can actually... <laughs> you can share information and it, it doesn't have to be a secret. It doesn't have to be something that you do on your own. Because uh, a lot of criticism is coming from the ancient alien or alternative history perspectives that there's this hierarchy and that historians or archaeologists have, uh, you know, these uh, persons sitting, deciding on what truth is at the top. And a lot of that origin is kind of, I mean, in, among our trolleys, we kind of for a long time have written papers by ourselves, putting it out. More and more, we started yeah. to work collaboratively as our trolleys start to incorporate a lot of different fields, meaning that you can't know everything yourself. But uh, do you see similar uh, development in uh, historic research that you're writing journals, articles as a team and not by yourself? I, I think so. Obviously, I, I can't speak from a very experienced point of view, but just <laughs> from what I've observed, um, like from my own university and all that, it does seem to be coming more collaborative. So, I mean, even conversations I've had when um, like I was discussing uh, like the potential of writing a thesis or things like that, like the support of people wanting to be able to work alongside you and there's not this secrecy like oh, I've got this idea and I don't want to share it with anybody else because you know what happens if they steal my idea and take it out to the world first mm. I feel like that is I, I from my own experience and again not nearly as experienced as you but I, I feel like there is a bit of a shift that's moving away from that and I think in the nicest possible way it's as <laughs> like the next generation of historians is emerging that that is going to become something that becomes a lot more comfortable because like people are growing up in a world that's much more accessible mm. where it's much more like it's normal like to be chatting it's normal to be sharing information so i think that's what's actually going to see that change if we look at the state of your field what do you feel is the biggest challenges from maybe a woman's perspective being within the classic historic research field? It, it's hard for me to answer that because I know obviously people do experience um, inequality because of their gender and and I definitely admit that it's out there. But for me personally, I, I haven't. So I, I've been incredibly lucky and I feel, again, that's because of my university, the environment that I've been there, I, I don't personally have that. The biggest challenge now is actually what I see through social media is how angry people get when you apparently have this audacity to want to share um, the achievements of women, which, as we said at the start, aren't necessarily so well publicised. And it, it's honestly bizarre. And it's not just men. You can't just say that it's men who are like, oh, no, women would never do this. Like, they it's coming from women as well, where they're like, oh, this, this never happened. This is nonsense. Your sources aren't accurate. Um, where it's, it seems to be, we need to overcome this perception that just because women traditionally were portrayed in one way, it doesn't make it always right. So I think that's, yeah, for me, it, that that's the challenge. It's nothing personal. It's more about sharing information um, and having people accept that information because that information is about a particular gender. So it's, I feel like when I talk about a male having done something, um, like very, oh, there's a myth I shared just to give a story, <laughs> but about the king who, like, he ended up getting defeated and then he was like, oh, never mind, I'll just let myself burn. So it's, it's a story that's half myth, half potential yeah. truth. Not very many angry people about that one. They were like, oh, what a brave man. That's fantastic. <laughs> Whereas on the other hand, when I share a similar myth about, oh, this woman, you know, she rallied the women together and off they scared all the Spartans. Everyone's like, oh, that's stupid. Like, there's no way. There's no way that that would happen. And the Spartans only ran away because, you know, they were like, we wouldn't dare hurt a woman. So, it, um, which, you know, is part of the story, but it's just the response. Like there needs to be a shift in the way that we look at evidence and not be biased or have this preconceived notion that just because it's about a certain gender that it's going to be more true or less true. I think that's one of the biggest challenges. So... Do you feel that the public perception about how the ancient world was is a bit, not pseudo-scientific maybe, but a misunderstanding of the current research? Or is it 
the current research haven't really catched up to the public imagination yet. No, I think it's the the perception. And this is just, again from speaking to people. So it's when we're looking at this historical time through our modern viewpoint. So it's like the whole women were oppressed, then that's just a blanket statement. When actually from our perspective, definitely, like definitely that that wasn't a good time to be alive. But at the same time, you need to look at it through an individual who's living there who doesn't know anything about what's going to happen in the year 2000 and something. Because, I mean, it was equally unfair for everybody. You look at Athens, for example. So they're like uh, one of the biggest, or not biggest arguments, but one of the main arguments that comes up is only men were citizens and women, you know, they weren't citizens. And that's taken as like this biggest affront. But actually the, the term citizen, as we view it, it's not that women were just going to get like put on a boat and kicked out of the country. It was it was at a different connotation. So, and men to earn that citizenship, like they didn't just get given it. They had to go and like be conscripted and live off in the middle of the jungle. There's no jungle, but like go live in the wilderness away from their family. Like there was all these other hoops that they had to jump through. Men had to participate in politics. So like, imagine if you hated politics, imagine if you hated war, like bad luck, like you're a man, you have to go and do that. So I think like it sucked for everybody when you're looking at it from a modern perspective. So I feel like there's a misunderstanding and a lot of the time, I, and I'm, I don't want it to be like I'm saying women had the greatest time in the whole wide world. Definitely they didn't. But I feel like we need to look at it not from a modern standpoint. We need to look at it like a contemporary to the time viewpoint and then maybe we can start understanding a bit more and becoming a bit more accepting that, yes, it looks like women were oppressed but not oppressed in the way that we view it. So therefore it makes it more possible that maybe women did run businesses or women could have done these other things um, because this idea that's been so ingrained in us isn't as accurate as we might have thought. No, it's fair. Um, Now the next question might not be super fair, but uh, do you think we can use history? But I mean, this is my preconceived notion about history and historians so uh, it's a bit colored by the archaeological lens there i can admit but do you think we can use history to unlock the other side of history how can we use historical documents that usually focusing on the upper class as i tend to understand it to unlock Mm -hmm. the um, well everyday person walking the street of athens or rome How would you approach that from the historical documentation that we have accessible? I think you'd need to sometimes read between the lines. I mean, the first thing that jumps to my mind is there was this gravestone a little while ago um, that I was reading about. And obviously, like the more elaborate gravestones and all of that, maybe now I'm stepping into archaeology, but anyway. (laughs) (laughs) from the... Roman Empire, but it was actually dedicated to a slave girl who was a hairdresser. But um, so obviously the the mistress or whoever the girl had been doing the hair and looking after had dedicated this gravestone to this girl. So I feel we need to look through their eyes and see what they were like writing about the every, how do I put it elegantly? Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know how to put it elegantly, how to put it <laughs> without rambling but basically looking reading between the lines so when they're talking about like the soldiers for example and like um it's normally a broad sweeping statement but um if we go to like one of the alexander the whole india battle mm. things like um one of the reasons that the india one that alexander lost is because the soldiers were fed up they were like well no we're not going to cross the river like we're tired we're hungry we've had enough we just want to go home and then alexander was like oh okay fine so I think that, <laughs> like, it, it's told from Alexander's perspective, but in a way, things like that is, it, it's giving us an understanding into how, like, the influence that the army, that the common soldier actually might have had on the way that a military campaign went. There's another really good, what was it, a study done on the battle, was it Marathon or something, where, um, the, again, we're just giving, like, this bulk number of, like, 300,000 men or whatever mm. it was were on the beaches 
And then so they're like, okay, well, if, realistically, if we take that number, then if we work backwards, how, how would they have eaten? How would they have gone to the toilet? Like all these things. Um, so like kind of working backwards from there, if they're saying it was this many people, what was the conditions like? Yeah. I, I, I don't know if I'm making sense, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I understand that you use the amount and then you work backward from that to see how it could have been. And uh, yeah. yeah, and then we can add the uh, archaeology to see if that's really correct with the reality. Technically, if we're going to have yeah. a scientific approach to trying to unlock this uh, issue. And this is maybe a harder question. So you saw three segments. We haven't talked too much about them because they were mostly, I don't know, not that fun maybe. <laughs> but... Uh, <laughs> They were. I can tell you about Constantine. <laughs> Nonsense they did there. <clears throat> oh, I forgot that Constantine was in there. I didn't take much note on the Constantine. <laughs> oh, well, I'll just tell you one quick thing that they did. So in one scene, they're talking about like the Emperor Constantine, the one who like started bringing Christianity yeah. into it. And, you know, they're like, oh, he saw the cross. And then they jump. And they just conveniently forget that there was another Constantine who came like 300 years later who was attributed to this Greek fire thing, but they just name him Constantine. <laughs> so they're like, yep, Constantine had this vision of the cross that was aliens, and then Constantine also got given this angel fire. So they, they literally combined two different Constantines together to fit their narrative. Yeah, the, I completely missed that. I have to be honest. <laughs> it's stupid. It's so <laughs> that one was probably the worst. And I had to go back and like I think I watched it like four or five times. And I'm like, am I understanding what they're saying properly here? Like, are they really trying to claim that th these two Constantines are the same person? But they, again, maybe I misunderstood. But that's what it looks like they're doing. So. No, I remember that they talked about the Constantine with the um, crosses in the sky. Who you know yep. introduced Christianity to the Roman Empire is usually depicted. I'm not sure how yep. correct that really is or how truthful he was about his conviction, but that's another discussion. But they never claim that there's two Constantine. They only refer to as this Constantine in the episode, actually. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So the Christian <laughs> one is like 300 AD, and then the Greek fire or the angel fire that they talk about, he comes in like to play. I, I think the first time that that's recorded is in 600 AD. So literally 300 years, is that 300 years? Yeah, that's 300 years. 300 years apart between these two. And they're like, no, Constantine had a vision. And then as a present, because he had this vision, they just gave him some magical fire to keep fighting the the demon overlords or whatever it is they're fighting. Yeah, they like to have evil uh, evil aliens for some reason. Yes. But yeah, that, that's interesting. I did not catch that. But again, that's really show how how much you have to know to really be able to <laughs> catch yeah, what they are it, doing it, because it's not something your everyday person would be able to catch, really, if you don't have a very strong interest in these uh, type of research, which make it so credulous. I, th I think also it's not even necessarily a strong interest. I think I feel the fact that the way it's presented, because it, is it on the History Channel? Is that where it, wherever it's? Yeah, it's on the History Channel again. Yeah. Yeah, so people, I feel, when they watch it, they might be watching it with a genuine interest, but the fact, like, one, it's on this channel called the History Channel, two, it's, like, on it's on TV and it's got this big production value that they, like, it's a naivety in thinking that something like that surely must be telling the truth. Like, there's no way the History Channel would lie to me, so it's a bit unfair. And then that they also mix these, because they usually tend to get one or two that have a credential not necessarily always in what they're talking about but they usually have phds yeah. that's smart mixed in with these other um, alienists as i call them uh, the, oh yeah they had the radio host yeah the radio <laughs> host, random radio host um, of yeah, talking he's quite, about sulfur blowing yeah, up. he's famous he hosts the uh, coast to coast uh, am in us which are very famous um, alien spooky supernatural radio show so he talks about which is uh, <laughs> sorry cut you off. no so he <laughs> more say. talks a lot of the, the different uh, experts within the you know field of supernatural 
And therefore he is supposed to be an expert in the supernatural and alien beings. But yeah, he's just a random guy having a radio show, uh, just like Joe Rogan and the others, basically. But he don't have any expert. But then you have him side by side with someone with a PhD who might be talking about their subject. Because that happens that the ancient aliens manage to find someone who might think they are going to do a, you know, two sides of the story kind of thing. And then just edit around the stuff that don't fit. And then they have P- yes. people with PhD that just believe in the ancient aliens idea who might be speaking on, um, you know, the archaeology of ancient Egypt, but have their PhD in um, medieval literature. You know, they don't really <laughs> just because you have a yes. PhD doesn't mean that you know everything about everything. It usually means that you know something very specific about a very limited area. But um, so that's why they like the title in the show, as you might have noticed if you paid attention to what happened down there. Yeah, it, <laughs> it's bizarre. But also, I got the sense, because when the, the astrologer was talking, I, uh, I feel like he was just generally talking about science. Like, I feel like he wasn't necessarily talking about aliens. And they're just like, yep, see, we've got an astrologer. He's talking about this stuff. It's definitely, yeah, but that's definitely true. Many who appeared on the show as expert who wasn't part of the you know alien sphere usually did so sometimes with false pretenses. They weren't really honest yes. in what they were doing, and then they talk, and then they just grab the sound by that fits the narrative that yeah. they want, and then just yeah. Now we have an expert saying that aliens could be real and that's great yeah which is unfair in itself isn't it because it's yeah i mean it's editing you out of context basically which is never a good thing but yeah and also then harming their reputation yeah luckily nobody seems to have suffered too much yet but you you never know Uh, there's many who especially those who appeared in the first season when they actually were bit trick people to appear on them because they were told that we're going to do a science versus aliens and then they just yeah, did I had no idea. Uh, did uh, you know aliens are real type of things and just edited the expert out some experts appear later in second season and then just realize that no matter how they talk or what they say they will be edited out of context and then you stop appearing on it let's put it like this did you learn something from the ancient alien that you watched how to <laughs> screenshot a coin and double check it's the right <laughs> I, 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 I honestly I think for me it's just the, um, the affirmation that you, you can't believe <laughs> really anything that's online or at least double check and and i think even if it's not ancient aliens it's a good um a good way to approach life if you hear something just accept it and then do your own research and just double check that what you've heard is right yeah no i I learned about angel fire that was great and a few aliens and elephants don't like aliens like that yep no no (laughs) (laughs) That's about the best message I got from that. So if people want to hear more from you, where should they go in that case? Um, So I'm on TikTok and uh, either the handle thing is Boring History because, of course, that's all I talk about is Boring History. (laughs) Um, Otherwise, I think if you look up Ancient History with Angela, then I should come up as well. Thank you for having me. It's been fun. (laughs) So hopefully I haven't rambled too much. Thank you for coming on. And again, a huge thank you to Angela for taking the time and for watching the clip show I put together for her. And if you want to check out more of her content, well, you find the links to all of her stuff down in the show notes or look up um, History with Angela on TikTok and Instagram. Make sure to follow that. She makes some great content out there. But... Until next time, please spread the word by leaving a positive review on platforms like iTunes, Spotify, or among your fellow trench dweller, or to your coworker, family, friend, random guy on the subway, 
there's several people you can speak with, I I think. If you want to know more about me and the, the podcast, you can go to diggingupancientaliens.com. There you can also find sources and resources. And if you want to support the show with more, and if you really want to support the show, head over to patreon.com slash diggingupancientaliens. Or if you want to get a bit extra for your buck, maybe you can instead head over to the archaeologicalpodcastnetwork.com where you can sign up and get a ton of bonus content, Slack channels, early ad-free episodes, more or less the same things you get on Patreon, but for all the shows on uh, the Archaeological Podcast Network. So if you want to support more at the same time, well, that might be an option. Or if you want to support me in particular, go to Patreon instead. We're currently offering a buy one, get one free deal on yearly membership. So if you buy a yearly Archaeological Podcast Network membership, you will get a code that you can give to your family, friend or, well, random guy on the subway if you want. And the offer is valid until December 31st, 2023. Terms and conditions apply. And if you want to contact me, it can be done through most social media sites. And if you have comments, corrections, and suggestions, or you're just hankering to write that email in all caps, you find my contact info on the website. Sandra Martelor created the intro music and our outro is by the band called Tralskruv, who sings their song Tinfoil Hat. Links to both of these artists can be found in the show notes. Until next time, keep shoveling that science. Oh, Men jag skyddar mig för jag har folie här Och så säger ni så säger det är en galen fantasi Att jag manipulerar oss med telepati Ni tycker att vi har redan är besatt Men jag skyddar mig för jag har Do you know where they originate from? No. <laughs> <laughs> then we can skip it. <laughs> or not, just keep it in there. Thank you for tuning in and listening to this episode. Remember that we have a subscription going on. You can become a patron or other subscriber for as little as two fifty per episode. Go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support. That is, go to diggingupancientaliens.com slash support to read more information and sign up right there. <laughs>